Explore today's must-have trends and innovative styles at Mrs. B's Clearance and Outlet. Shop one-of-a-kind finds in today's must-have trends. Explore wall-to-wall deals, furniture, flooring, mattresses, home accents, seasonal favorites, and more. Discover unique new home decor, pillows, accessories, and more. There's something perfect for your style and budget. There's new inventory every day at up to 80% off suggested retail. Discover the style and savings of Mrs. B's Clearance and Outlet. Seeking the truth never gets old. Introducing June's Journey, the free-to-play mobile game that will immerse you in a thrilling murder mystery. Join June Parker as she uncovers hidden objects and clues to solve her sister's death in a beautifully illustrated world set in the roaring 20s. With new chapters added every week, the excitement never ends. Download June's Journey now on your Android or iOS device or play on PC through Facebook games. West Memphis 3. West Memphis 3. Damian Eccles and Jason Baldwin. Jesse Miss Kelly. Who West Memphis 3. They were just eight years old. Stephen Branch, Michael Moore, and Christopher Byers found murdered, hog tied, and naked in a drainage ditch in West Memphis. West Memphis 3. I am very excited for this upcoming conversation. This evening, I am joined in the garage by a one Dan Stidham, a man who has been an attorney, currently a judge, a true crime author on a case that he worked for most of his life, and a case that many people out there listening know very well. That's the West Memphis Three case the case from Arkansas, 1993. Dan, Mr. Stidham, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. It's an honor. Would you tell us a little bit about your journey, you know, just your life's journey from being a young man, becoming an attorney, and now a judge? Uh, Sure. Um, I was born in Chicago, wanted to be a lawyer uh, my entire life. Uh, According to my mother, I used to stand on tree stumps in the yard and and uh, give closing arguments to juries. Uh, I guess you'd have to rely on my mom for her uh, credibility, but that's what she says anyway. <laughs> I've always wanted to be a criminal lawyer. I had no interest in, in uh, anything else. And um, that's why I became a, a judge is because uh, – 99% of what I do as a judge is, uh, involves criminal law. So I feel like I'm in where I'm supposed to be. Did you always want to represent defendants, or did you ever see yourself as maybe on the other side as a prosecutor? No, I've always felt like I belonged in the defense uh, category, and, and I'm not sure where that comes from. I've been told that I have a savior complex by some people. <laughs> And I'm not sure exactly what that means, but um, I just feel strongly about the Constitution and not the most recent interpretations of it, but uh, the the original, you know, the Fourth Amendment and the Fifth Amendment and the Sixth Amendment. And it's very important to me that, that people have and, and they deserve uh, a zealous uh, defense, despite the how gruesome the case may be or how simple it may be. It's uh, it's very important to me. I, I'm became a public defender because of that. And I thought it was a great way to get experience uh, as a young lawyer. Uh, After saying what everybody says after they graduate from law school, I'm never going back to my hometown again, uh, except to visit my parents. And and, uh, naturally, I ended up right back in Perigold, Arkansas. So (laughs) um, here I am still. Looking back uh, on this, I, I, I see my life as having two segments, one that was normal and one that became, uh, I'd hate to use the word abnormal, but the the other end of the stick, uh, sort of, because uh, on 
May the 7th, I believe it was, 1993, my life changed forever, and I had no idea what I was getting involved in <laughs> um, or how long it would take or that I would end up writing a book about it. That's a great question. So why the book now? The book came out late last year. It's a fantastic, it's a fascinating read, but why do you choose to break what's referred to as your self-imposed silence after all of these years? And that is a very good question, and, and it's got a pretty simple answer. Um, number one, um, in 2008, when I became a full-time judge and was no longer able to work on the case, I became a witness uh, in the case, um, with, the, with the issue being ineffective assistance of counsel. And in my book, I'm very candid about this was my first jury trial, and most people are shocked by that. Uh, a triple homicide of three eight-year-olds, uh, not exactly a perfect fit for your first jury trial. <laughs> it's like going to the Super Bowl in your uh, rookie year. I expected fully when I accepted the case, thought my wife, or now ex-wife, Kim would talk me out of it, but she encouraged me, which surprised me. So I took it, even though my father had admonished me not to. Uh, I was 30 years old, and, and I thought it was a good idea, so I did it. I don't have any regrets. Um, it's been a long, hard run, and um, I've suffered from it. I uh, lost my marriage because of it. Uh, it affected my children. It affected my health. Uh, Stole my faith, uh, which has now been restored. It was a very, very uh, rough trip. And I think, as I said in the book, I, I uh, was on a long journey. I didn't have time to pack because <laughs> things were happening so quickly. There's that line in my life, the, the first 30 years, and now I'm in my 61st year. And I realized uh, back on March 3rd when I turned 61 that I was an old person all of a sudden. So I'm, I'm older than dirt. And I didn't realize that at 60, but the day I woke up 61, I, it, everything hurt. Everything. My knees hurt, my, my back hurt. And so uh, uh, I guess it's official. I'm, I'm old. That part I can't change. So um, it is what it is. It is. The title of the book is A Harvest of Innocence. What does that phrase mean to you? Well, there's no winners in this case. First, because of the, the way that it, it unfolded and the um, treachery that was involved in obtaining the conviction uh, in the first place. Uh, there were Things such as jury misconduct, prosecutorial misconduct, police misconduct, which is imputed to the prosecutor, which I firmly believe. And, um, and I speak of it freely in the book. But to get back to your original question, the second prong, the Alford plea was not my doing. I was a witness in my own ineffective assistance to counsel hearing, which wasn't a pleasant thing to do, but it, it was something that I had to do, of course. And, and I told the truth, which most lawyers don't. Uh, they always say I, it was trial strategy. That's why I did it this way. They never admit that they did anything wrong because their ego won't permit it. But I don't have an ego. I have an, an absolute obligation and duty to my client. And so I told the truth. And I was very unprepared to have this be my first jury trial. It violated the American Bar Association standards that, um, uh, that were in place at the time. And even though I thought it was going to be for plea, simply getting my client ready to testify against the other two, it didn't turn out that way and it ended up being a, a jury trial. So uh, I had been involved in a couple capital murder cases uh, in law school, a conspiracy to commit capital murder case, capital murder case as a public defender, uh, or I should say an apprentice to the public defender, our county public defender at the time. So, I mean, I, I had some experience, but it wasn't, you know, the experience that you need to conduct a uh, a jury trial. Everybody tells me I did a wonderful job, um, and despite how sure I am that it really must have hurt Judge Burnett, sadly, to proclaim me as the best lawyer that ever walked the planet, the truth of the matter is 
I wasn't ready for this task, and I didn't uh, pull any punches. I I uh, I criticized everybody for their mistakes in the book, including my own. It is what it is, and my fear in life, my greatest fear in life, was um, I didn't know the Alfred plea was happening until the night before. I got a courtesy phone call from the prosecutor, so I had no idea why it was happening, because during the Rule 37 hearing, we had completely and totally destroyed the state's case. I I mean, it made them look like idiots, and that's a tough word, but uh, it's the truth that uh, Ms. Kelly's confession made absolutely no sense. There's no such thing as a satanic ritual homicide, despite the fact that some people go to seminars in 2024 to learn about satanic ritual crimes. There's just, it's a fairy tale. I just don't hold back, and and um, but the Alfred plea itself is is a oxymoron, as my former colleague uh the late um, Dennis Reardon from San Francisco, who was Damien's attorney, one set of his, he had East Coast attorneys and West Coast attorneys. That's how Dennis Reardon, who passed away a couple of years ago, he described it as an oxymoron. And it is because I don't let people in my courtroom plead guilty to something they didn't do. So why are we doing this? Even though we're maintaining our innocence, it's still going to be a conviction in the light of the law. So why are we doing this when we're going to get a new trial and we're going to win straight up in the courtroom, which has been my dream for Many, many years, most of my adult life, as you pointed out, uh, I was shocked and I didn't understand it. It was good for Damien because he'd been on death row for 18 years and 78 days and he was ready to get out of there and I don't blame him. And it was good for Jesse Miss Kelly because he's intellectually challenged and whether he has a felony conviction or not, it's not going to affect the outcome of his life because his disability is permanent. There's no cure for it. It's not going to help him get a job. It's not going to help him in life so or or create any problems for him in life so um but jason baldwin was the one who took it on the chin and basically sacrificed himself and his demand uh for for justice and to be declared innocent like uh, like which was my dream as well part of the offer plea was that um all three defendants who maintained their innocence had to stay out of trouble for 10 years or they would um, end up having to serve the rest of their terms, which I cannot remember the the number of years. It's been 12 years ago. Had they committed another crime, which they never did, then they would have had to go back to prison. So I wanted to wait 10 years before I came out with my book because I did not want to piss anybody off that would that would create a problem for these three young men whose lives had been destroyed uh, just for the sake of uh, having somebody to blame it on, having a scapegoat. And I wanted to get past that 10-year period. And so uh, during that 10-year period, I started writing. And uh, I had been writing for a number of years even before. Finally, uh, I came to terms with uh, what it cost me. And what it cost me, selfishly, was the right to walk back into that courtroom and win uh, a case that I should have won at trial, and I should have won on direct appeal to the Arkansas Supreme Court. We were going to win after the Rule 37 hearing. So I'm sitting here wondering, why are we doing this? But at, at the time, it seemed like a win, for, for at least for my client and Damien. But uh, Jason is the one who suffered the most. And it took me a while to be able to talk about some of these deep, dark things that I had to endure. And getting back to your original question, um, the harvest of, or a harvest of innocence, there's two reasons for that. One, there was a journalist uh, who... Uh, the, I don't know if he still has a column with the largest newspaper in Arkansas, the Democrat Gazette, or not, but he wrote an article, and that was the title of the article. And essentially, he said, I don't know what they proved, but uh, the only thing I know for sure is is that this was, I uh, can't remember his exact words, a cruel harvest of innocence or a terrible harvest of innocence. And so that just kind of stuck in my mind. And, and when I was exploring ideas for the title of the book, uh, that's what I came up with. And when I contacted uh, my co-author and we began in earnest writing the book in 2014, 
uh, he hated the title. He could because he couldn't understand it because he didn't. He was one of the few people on the planet that didn't know anything about the West Memphis case. So I had to bring him up to speed, which was, of course, a, a difficult task to do. And after we got near the end, uh, he said, "I like the title because it's, it rings true." It's the this was uh, the, the, actually Philip Martin who wrote the article called it the evil harvest of innocence. But I didn't want the book to sound like a you know some kind of uh, what, what is the word I'm looking for something that wasn't true crime. Something that was you know, I didn't want to make it into a monster movie. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, and I mean the case itself. There's already enough evil in it. Yeah, we've we've been through that part of it certainly. Now I'm glad that you referred to it as an oxymoron because that's exactly as I saw it. And I I remember all those years ago when the news broke. It was like during the week at some point, and I was meeting a friend of mine for lunch, and I said to him, "You said the person you just mentioned was one of the few people on the planet that had never heard of the." West Memphis three case. Well, my, my friend that I was meeting for lunch that day knew almost nothing about it as well. And I said, I I was angry. And I said, he goes, what are you so angry about? I said, well, this case, and he goes, I don't know nothing about the case, Nick, but what is, what is this Alfred plea thing? And I said, look, I said, I don't know much about it either. I said, but here's my understanding of it, that if you, if you beg and plea that you are innocent, they will keep you locked up in prison for 18 years. But but if you tell them that you're guilty and yeah, I did it, they'll let you go free. Like that's, uh, that was my interp my, my novice interpretation of it in, in anger that moment. There's, there's a very compelling chapter in the book about me trying to gain access to my client before the, the plea and, and the hoops I had to jump through to, to be able to do that. And I, I don't want to give anything away, but, but, uh, I didn't realize it at the time, but they thought that I was there to stop the Alfred plea. And like I said, at the time, I thought it was a win because my client was going home. I promised him uh, after he was convicted that I would never give up until he got to go home and be with his dad. And and I I was keeping my promise. So I thought, this is good. Uh, The world's been lifted off my shoulder. Um, I can write my book when it's time and but it's more complicated than that, and it's very complicated to that. And the younger the audience that I speak to, the harder it is to explain because they don't understand. And, you know, to give you an example, someone in my court just the other day said, well, I'm not guilty, but I'm going to plead guilty just to get this over with. And I said, no, you're not. I'll see you in July for trial. We're going to have a trial hmm. because i got to be able to sleep tonight. Mm-hmm. Um, you either did it or you didn't, and if you didn't, I'll acquit you. And if you did, then I'll set your punishment. We don't do Alfred pleas in my courtroom because I don't believe in them. So it took me literally eight of those 10 years before we published to really dig down deep enough to understand, A, why, B, how did it happen? Who mm-hmm. whose idea was it, and who who uh, came up with the idea, and and um, because I Nick, I had always imagined myself I, all these years and during these eighteen years and seventy eight days of being Russell Crowe walking into the Coliseum with a large sword cutting the heads off my enemies, and I was really looking forward to that. Right, and uh, and all of a sudden they pull the rug out from under me. I was not exonerated, so my innocence was harvested. My innocence was harvested because of what uh, it did to my family and my marriage and my life. Um, But that pales in comparison, obviously, to the innocence that was harvested from the three eight-year-olds, their their parents and grandparents and family uh, and siblings, and it's horrible. I lost a child myself uh, a couple of years ago. It'll be three years in October an adult child and I just got a phone call one day and says your son's dead and so suddenly I'm in the club and and it's a club you don't want to be in and so I actually went back um, and poured the rough draft of the book through that filter of being uh, the parent of a deceased child And and I think it helped the tone and the particularly the ending of the book. And then my also my wife lost her second born, uh, who was 39 years old. It, um, it changed things. Uh, you look through it through a different set of glasses than you did before. So, and also it 
harvested the innocence of uh, the West Memphis Three and their parents and their families. I used to have nightmares of going to jail for something I didn't do. And, of course, I knew why I was having the nightmares, but uh, it didn't make it any more pleasant. Uh, it was tough. I didn't deal with the stress appropriately of losing a child, so I understand better their situation. Two of the three sets of parents ended up uh, on our team at the end, um, which was uh, certainly feather in our cap. Why would we give up a case that we were going to win? That's been the thing that's been bugging me for the last 10 years. I decided, uh, I say I decided, Tom McCarthy, my co-author, uh, who, who eventually fell in love with the, with the title, he um, and I agreed to, to tell the story differently than it's ever been told. Mm -hmm. There's two reasons for that, because number one, it's, it's never been told with this sort of uh, narrative, and second, it's the truth. It, it's the truth that's never been told. So people who choose to go out and buy Harvest of Innocence and read it, they're going to be shocked, especially if they've kept up with the case over the years, or they're newbies who weren't even born yet. Uh, that's our highest uh, audience uh, on Facebook is 18 to 30-year-olds who weren't even born yet when, when this happened. So everybody says the, the OJ trial was the uh, trial of the century, and I disagree. Of course, I'm a little bit biased. This case has never, ever been out of the headlines for the last 31 years. Yeah, and I don't know that it's that it goes away, unfortunately. No, I, I agree. I agree completely. And um, there's so many things similar to what happened in Salem, Massachusetts. And, and I mean, it, it happened almost exactly a hundred years apart. And here we are still burning witches at the stake in 1993. Um, and we continue to do that because people can't wrap their minds around what a false confession is. And um, that was my biggest enemy besides the judge and the prosecutor themselves, um, who prosecutors are all about winning. Good prosecutor is interested in justice, but a Right. But a bad prosecutor is winning at all costs. I guess that's why I've always <laughs> been, been a defense attorney. Um, and, you know, I was afraid when I ran for judge that uh, people were going to be afraid of former public defender being a judge. They thought I was going to turn everybody loose. But I call them as I see them, just like an umpire in a ball game. That's a bad metaphor, I suppose, but but uh, that's the truth. I'm glad I waited those 10 years, not just for the sake of the West Memphis Three, but I needed that 10 years to let all this soak in and read the transcripts of the Rule 37 hearings, which I was excluded from because I was a witness and was not allowed to be in the courtroom. I knew, you know, in a basic format because of, they provided affidavits of what the witnesses were going to testify to, but there were things that shocked me in those transcripts that uh, made me start asking questions and that I wanted the answer to, but nobody wanted to talk about it. Right. It's like, hey, we we got out of this uh, with and saved face. We got off the boat before it sunk. Back to the narrative that we chose for the book, we chose the Titanic is the best uh, example. Uh, in the Titanic, the movie starts out with the um, recovery vessel or the, the vessel that was sending the sub down to the wreck uh, for the first time. And one of the very few survivors left at the time. And then the story morphed into her telling her story, sort of uh, the background, which was compelling. I thought, that's what we need to do. Mm -hmm. And it took me a while to convince Tom of that. But I didn't want, you know, Mara's book, which was outstanding, and um, Devil's Not. And um, I keep expecting my thank you card from her because she's selling a lot of books these days <laughs> because of my book. <laughs> my book kind of comes in and finishes the story. And all those things that I couldn't tell Mara about or and all the things that I couldn't tell the documentarians about, you know, I'm sure they're not happy with me because um, you don't want to call the 800-pound gorilla uh, names or poke him with a stick uh, and expect them to later rule in your favor on a case that you've sworn to overturn. And so I couldn't write the book. I couldn't tell the documentarians uh, about uh, what I knew because... I had to depend on the Arkansas Supreme Court to do the right thing, and ultimately they did 
And it wasn't a coincidence that Judge Burnett was finally off the case and it happened months later that they overturned his decision and sent it back for consideration for a new trial, which we were going to get, not just because of uh, my inexperience as a lawyer in 1993 and 1994 when the trial was held, but because Judge Burnett had committed some ethical violations and he should have recused himself from the case but refused. So we were going to win on that issue alone. So I started digging and um, trying to figure out how this all came about. It took years trying to convince people to talk about it. Some of them wanted to talk about it but wouldn't for political reasons. Some of them knew why but wouldn't tell me on the record because they were afraid that they wouldn't be able to work in, in our bailiwick here in northeast Arkansas. And then I understand that because I, I've had the same feelings for, for years. You know, I wanted to talk about these things, but I thought I, I got a job. <laughs> I need to make a living and feed my kids. So it was time. The weather's getting warmer. Time to ditch the jackets and sweaters for shorts and tees. But there's no need to waste money on clothes that last only one season with Quince. Now, you can get high-quality pieces that never go out of style, that you'll be wearing year after year. Quince has all of the seasonal must-haves, like 100% European linen shirts from $30, performance polos, and versatile flow-knit activewear. The best part? All Quince items are priced 50 to 80% less than similar brands. By partnering directly with top factories, Quince cuts out the cost of the middleman and passes the savings on to us. And Quince only works with factories that use safe, ethical, and responsible manufacturing practices, along with premium fabrics and finishes. I love Quince. I've been filling my closet with Quince, and I will be doing so in the warmer months as well. I'm buying high-quality pieces that never go out of style. They're always in fashion, and they last. They're durable, and they're quality. Upgrade your wardrobe. Go to quince.com slash garage for free shipping on your order and 365-day returns. That's Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash garage to get free shipping and 365-day returns. Quince.com slash garage. Warmer, sunnier days are calling. Fuel up for them with Factor's no prep, no mess meals. Meet your wellness goals in time for summer thanks to the menu of chef crafted meals with options like Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, and Keto. Factor's fresh, never frozen meals are dietitian approved and ready to eat in just two minutes. So, no matter how busy you are, you'll always have time to enjoy nutritious, great tasting meals. With 35 different meals and more than 60 add-ons to choose from every week, you'll always have new flavors to explore. Crush your wellness goals this May with dietitian approved meals and ingredients that you can trust. Make your day delicious, from breakfast to dessert. Stay fueled with easy, nutritious options. Treat yourself to restaurant-quality meals that feature premium ingredients like filet mignon, shrimp, and blackened salmon. I am new to Factor, and I have been loving every minute of it. I have a problem, and it's called lunch. Some days I need to pack a lunch, and some days I work from home. Whether I'm at home or whether I'm on the go, Factor is fueling my lunch from now on. Head to factormeals.com slash truecrimegarage50 and use code truecrimegarage50 to get 50% off your first box, plus 20% off your next month. That's code True Crime Garage 50 at factormeals.com slash True Crime Garage 50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month while your subscription is active. As a True Crime Garage listener, you know the world can be a dangerous and unpredictable place. With every case, we've learned one thing your best line of defense is your vigilance and preparation. That's why you should invest in Simply Safe Home Security today. Simply Safe was named Best Home Security Systems 2024 by the U.S. News and World Report. Newsweek ranked it Best Customer Service in Home Security. Whole 
home protection is what you get with Simply Safe. It's sensors to detect break ins, fires, floods, and more. Plus, you can get a variety of indoor and outdoor cameras. It's backed by 24 7 professional monitoring for less than $1 a day. No contracts and a 60 day money back guarantee. Simply Safe is simply one of the very best security systems that you can purchase for your home and your property. And I've been telling you about Simply Safe for years now and how great they are. But don't just take my word for it. U.S. News, World Report, and Newsweek are all saying, check out Simply Safe, one of the best in the business. Simply Safe has given me and many of my listeners real peace of mind. I want you to have it too. Get 20% off any new Simply Safe system when you sign up for Fast Protect Monitoring. Just visit simplysafe.com slash garage. That's simplysafe.com slash garage. There's no safe like Simply Safe. At the same time, though, too, I mean, it's a it's a conflict of interest. And if you would have went down that road, I mean, you have the fiduciary duty to keep your client's best interest at at heart and in mind at, at all times. And that was my guiding light through, throughout. And it, and had you gone down that road, you would have been no better than the prosecutor who was just looking for a win, and and Burnett who decided that this was his his case and this was good and wanted things his way, and so. I applaud you for doing that. Burnett was a prosecutor before he was a circuit judge, but he never forgot he was a prosecutor. One of the legends I learned as of early on is, uh, uh, I don't know if it's true, if it was a myth or what it was, but it certainly circulated pro- prolifically, uh, was that one time a prominent lawyer from Jonesboro uh, during a jury trial in a criminal case said, Judge, why don't you and the prosecutors wear jerseys with your names on the back so there won't be any confusion on the part of the jury that you're on the same team? (laughs) And that's pretty much the way it was throughout our trial as well. I'm glad that you mentioned Mar Leverett's book, The Devil's Knot, because I was telling somebody the other day that it's it's so sad that this is a true story because her book's almost a perfect book, a a perfect crime mystery book. And then there's been no shortage of books to come out about this case over the years, but so many of them are largely opinionated pieces. Biased and mythological. Yeah. And then your book comes out. And the reason why I was so excited about your book was knowing that you are an officer of the court, that you would be holding yourself to a a different standard than those other books that were coming out. And I knew when when I got the opportunity to read it, that I better keep my eyeballs open and be paying attention at all times because the information in those pages is going to be far superior to that than books that have come out since. We self-published, and the reason that we self-published is we spent a couple of years shopping this thing around publishers and their response was always, oh, this story's been told in several books and four documentaries and a feature film. And one of the things that people don't understand or realize that I didn't feel like I needed to put it in the book. Uh, and well, Maybe I did. I don't remember. <laughs> uh, I worked on that thing so many times and read it a million times that uh, yep. sometimes I'm surprised when someone asks me about page such and such. <laughs> And I said, oh, well, yeah, I did say that, didn't I? But but um, I actually turned down potentially $100,000 for not being uh, in Devil's Knot as the main character um, because I didn't want to be a part of a horror flick and I wanted to retain my life story right so I could write this book. So one of the myths surrounding this case is that I'm a millionaire, that HBO paid me millions of dollars to participate in those documentaries. I'm just the average Joe. I work paycheck to paycheck and hope I got enough money at the end of the month to pay the bills, which reminds me today's the third and my house payment was due on the first. And that, 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 that kind of stuff really gigs me because I mean, it just, it's ridiculous. I, I never made a nickel. Yeah. Other than what the court paid me. And and they didn't even pay you what they said they were going to pay no, you. No, Judge Burnett said you're going to get paid $40 an hour for 
you know, investigation and, and witness preparation and discovery and things of that nature, and then $60 an hour for in court. And we ended up not only getting was $19 and change, $21.73 per hour to be exact. <laughs> I made yeah. a note earlier today. Um, and we had over 2,000 hours in the case. More, tw- almost twice as much as some of the other lawyers and legal teams. And we also received the least amount of all three legal teams. I, I feel like that was out of spite. Oh, it was. I mean, I agree completely. And I asked Judge Burnett, can you explain to me how you came to these calculations? And he refused to answer the question. Math is not his strong suit. but you know and it's funny because you know maybe not not so funny but people see people on tv and they just make this assumption that that equals a lot of money and i've i've been fortunate enough to be a part of a few different documentaries myself and you know, I was going to say, if your paycheck was anything like mine uh, that I received from those documentaries, we should just hold hands and feel bad for each other. Ask my kids about their student loan payments. They'll tell you. <laughs> exactly. Now, this the, the thing here, though, too, that I feel like this is one of those cases that, and to say it's polarizing would be the understatement of the year. But with this case, I think that it gets lost on some people that there are so many victims in this case, but it really truly starts with the three boys, Chris, Michael, and Stevie. Sure. And I really loved the way that you chose to start your book at the very beginning of the book. I could feel your anger when you said the killer is alive today. I am sure of it. He had breakfast today. Maybe he checked his mail went to work, watched TV, or took a drive. He's been doing whatever he's been doing since May 5th, 1993. Tell us exactly what that what that means to you and why you chose to to put those words on that page. Because I'm still looking for a kill, killer, and I'll never stop looking until I, I take my last breath. And that sounds noble and maybe too noble for some of those people who don't believe uh, the innocence of the West Memphis Three, but... Uh, I always think about what Mark Twain once Mark Twain once said: "Never argue with a fool, because onlookers will not be able to tell the difference." I choose not to engage people who don't have the intellectual capacity to understand science and and facts. Um, and uh, and if people are upset about that, then they can be upset. Send me an email, uh, knock on my door, whatever. Uh, but it's the truth. If if you read my book. And you don't come to the conclusion that these three kids are innocent. There's something wrong with you. And I I know that sounds harsh, but uh, after 30 something years of this, these few people who some people refer to them as nons, some people uh, refer to them as the intellectually challenged. I refer to them as just a pain in my ass. Uh, I hope I can say that on your podcast. There's no sense arguing with them because you're never going to convince them anyway. So I just avoid them. But, you know, my my goals in writing the book, which I have to answer the narrative question a little bit with a little more detail. I didn't go into Damien and and, uh, Jason's trial for a reason because I wasn't their lawyer. Mm. Later on, I uh, became a ninja and was Jason's lawyer in, in the bushes. But um, I wanted to talk about the book is my story. Right. And sometimes I felt like Forrest Gump. I just kind of happened to be there when everything happened. And the narrative is the same as Abraham Lincoln, the movie, and Titanic. Uh, we all know the, the boat sank and uh, thousands of people died. And we know that President Lincoln got shot in Ford Theater and, and died. But while we're watching the films, we're all praying and hoping to get up, get out of that bed and be president again. We need you. It was very important for me to not let the record be set with the Alfred plea that nobody understands. I wanted to tell the goals of my book were to, A, tell my story, which is the least of my goals. For the book. Uh, second, I wanted to explain to everybody what a 
uh, false confession was and why Jesse Miss Kelly gave one. And if you actually look at the science involved, then it's easy to see. But if you're not willing to look at it or understand it or even consider it, then you're never going to understand that. But I didn't write it for money. I wrote it because I wanted the truth to be out there. I wanted people to really have a true understanding of what took place, why it took place, and the motives behind it. I think you've earned the right to be as harsh as you want. I mean, you've had to <laughs> you've had to watch you've had to watch so many people be be bullied and wronged for so long. And it, it's not just the the defendant that you represented and he and the other two young men that were prosecuted as well, but also Chris's Christopher's family and Michael's family and Stevie's family. And it's, I mean, you've, you've had to have regular interaction with people that were wronged and bullied for so long. I don't know, to be frank with you, I think you're overly polite. I don't, you know, you're, you're, you're incredibly polite for, for having to endure that for so long. Well, as I stated at the, at the beginning of the book, um, even though I've earned the right to be angry, um, I'm no longer angry because the, the, the truth is coming out. And uh, there's an old uh, saying, and I can't remember it, and I shouldn't be trying to say something I can't remember, but uh, the, the, the truth starts out as something that is uh, people are angry about and won't accept, and then it eventually is accepted as the truth, and that's kind of what took place here. To give you an example of, of why I, I, I think it's funny that some of these people just won't come off of the not believing their innocence, uh, one silly person uh, on Amazon wrote very harsh um, review that I didn't even talk about a Bible confession, or I didn't talk about this, or I didn't talk about that. I can't even remember them. And I addressed each and every one of them. Uh, yeah, the person couldn't have read the book. You absolutely addressed the Bible confession. The state of Arkansas would love nothing better than this thing to go away, and I'll be damned if I would let that happen without a true accounting of, of the story. Uh, and they, they, they clearly don't. I mean, obviously, in any case, the state, Arkansas, Texas, Ohio, what have you, no state would want to compensate, but they don't want to compensate these three men for spending 18 years in prison. Well, the, the offer plea will always be there. So that'll, that means no compensation, but they deserve exoneration. Yep. And uh, Jason Baldwin would like to go to law school, but he, he can't because he's a convicted felon and he could go and get his degree, but he'd never be able to practice law. They probably can't vote own a firearm, a few different, I would think there would be a few different restrictions on them. Based on well, he told me not too long ago that he doesn't go out of the country anymore because every time he gets strip searched and cavity searched and, and, um, feels like he's in prison again. He's staying for the rest of his life. Yeah. And, and, um, uh, which reminds me, I owe him a phone call. He and I have been playing phone tag for the last uh, week or so. Um, well, and and he's somebody that I would love to talk to because I know that, like, and you put it pointed out so clearly and concisely in your book, and I appreciated this because that Alfred plea was an all or nothing deal. It was all three of you say yes or all three of you, you know, one no in the group, and we're not doing this thing. And like you said earlier. Jason, he had the least amount to gain and the and and the most to lose most by to lose. agreeing to that plea deal. And I I would I would love to hear it from him exactly. And I can't speak for him, but I mm -hmm. did interview him, and he provided some great information. Some of which I wasn't even aware of uh, because I I wasn't at his trial, nor did I represent him. And I explained how I did that in the book because his lawyers had abandoned him and I couldn't stand to see him not be on board the train that led to uh, hopefully exoneration someday. Um, maybe the governor who's going to pardon him is in junior high right now. I don't know, but uh, I may not be around when, when that happens, but eventually it's going to happen because somebody's going to do the right thing. Well, and I want to tell the people out there listening, I've 
here was my takeaway from the book. I've read just about everything I can get my hands on about this case. I've watched, listened to just about everything that I could get my hands on about this case over the years. I pick up your book, and I, as I said earlier, I was excited because of your position. You being an officer of the court, I knew that it was going to be – I was expecting a different, uh, higher standard, and you certainly delivered on that. Like uh, Your word, I, I can take you for your word where these other opinion pieces, I can't because I don't know who those people or, are or their background or how much time they've actually spent looking at the case. So I was excited for the book to come out. And I, one thing I do when I'm reading these true crime books, just by the nature of my job, by hosting the show, is I take notes. And usually I'm only going to write down something if it's new information to me or expanded information to me. And your book, I, I have a note here to mention 97 notes I made. <laughs> wow. Uh, from your book. And so, and I, t this is what I, I, I want everybody to understand. This book is for people that think that the West Memphis three are guilty. This is for the people that think that they're innocent. Most importantly, this is for the people that sit on the fence that can't decide, are they guilty? Are they innocent? This is the, this is the, the eye opener, the way that you delivered it and what you witnessed and the back door dealings and behind the scenes stuff that is explained in your book paradise lost was an entertaining show right it, there's there's not a whole lot of concrete information in those documentaries to really sway somebody one way or the other in my opinion it was a setting on the fence Yes. Narrative. And it was but it was good and it was necessary and we we probably only ended up at this result because, because of, of yeah, exactly. Paradise Lost. You and I wouldn't be having this conversation right now. Exactly. Been for that. Well, and and you know what, frankly, I I didn't want to be rude earlier, but uh Judge Burnett would not have had to agree to pay $40 an hour for you to investigate the case if West Memphis PD would have done a good job investigating the case. <laughs> I want the listeners to know that a lot of the stuff that we're talking about here today is not, you know, we're kind of jumping in and out of the book. So don't walk away from this conversation thinking that you don't need to, this is an absolute must read. So let me hit some things that are not in the book here. If you allow me to Dan. All right. one thing that, you know, and you, you do touch on this a little bit, but I want to get, I want to get your man to man answer here representing a teenager defendant certainly has to present its own unique set of challenges for a defense attorney so what challenges did you have representing 17 year old jesse miss kelly the best way to describe that is it's like not having a client at all no assistance from your client no he uh, he didn't even know what a lawyer was he thought we were cops he tried desperately to tell the, the the same story that he told the West Memphis police to us, but he would get things so wrong. And of course, the, the confession itself is so ridiculous. I mean, the the time that it happened, uh, and um, they were tied up with a big brown rope, and the boys skipped school that day, and so did Jason Baldwin. None of that was even possible. It didn't happen that way. But the cops just keep on going on like, you know, nothing ever happened. Uh, just, you know, so what? He's telling us that things that are, aren't, aren't true. But um, uh, they acted like they didn't care. And at one point, uh, mentally handicapped or not, if you have to ask a 17-year-old boy what a penis is, that should be telling you that you're dealing with somebody who's intellectually challenged. They had to ask him if he knew how to tell time. And, and then, and that's another great um, uh, something that you know. Uh, do not. Tell and, and at and at no point do they go. <laughs> at no point do they go. All right, we have to ask this guy. Does he know how to tell time? Oh wait, maybe we should stop this interview because it's kind of pointless at this point, right? If you have to ask a seventeen-year-old if they know how to tell time, and imagine the frustration of these officers uh, who spent the. Uh, the better part of 12 hours, uh, it wasn't the 12th hour that he gave the first confession. You know what? This is one thing that intrigued me. So I, I think 
Dan, that I, I'm not going to lie to you. I struggled with this case. And it, yes, there's so many obvious signs that they're innocent, but there's also, there are some gray areas and question marks. And, and, and you will agree that it is difficult for a lot of people to get over the fact that somebody may have offered up a false confession to something so heinous and multiple false confessions to something so heinous. It, it, it is hard for a lot of persons to get over that. And, and I'm in that camp, but one of the, one of the things for me it, trying to play detective from a thousand miles away was, was that confession. And when he mentioned noon, the time of noon, I believe, and I, I think it might've been Mara Leverett's book, devil's not where she's talking about she you know she's so in depth with the timeline of everything and the movements of everybody on in early may and then in early june i think that it's she says in her book and you know jesse miss kelly better than most so correct me if i'm wrong was he working his roofing job the day that the boys were found he did, but at noon, he decided he didn't like it. It wasn't any fun, so he didn't go back after lunch. And he, here has always been my thought, my thought on Jesse's perception of everything. I think that when he was leaving the roofing job that day, that he heard on the radio that the boys had been found and, or saw the news shortly later at some time later that day. And I think that he thought he was giving the police the correct answer because he, I think he thinks that that's when they truly were killed. Well, he told it's in the officer's notes. The, the, he, he told him at first he, he thinks Damien did it, but, but it was actually the next day that the bodies were found. Right. Uh, now in relationship to the, the confession was about a month later, but, but, uh, yeah, man, the, the, you're right. In the, in the confession, everything's so wrong. The officers just acted like, you know, so, so what? We got a confession. And then I wish all these years, I, one of the things I wished I could have been there when it happened is when John Fogelman walked over to the police station in West Memphis and either listened to the confession tape, which was only like 29 minutes long, I believe. Yep. Get back in there and fix this. This this couldn't have happened this way. I'm just guessing that's what he said. I don't, but he sent him back in. And Gitchell walks back in the interrogation room and he says, Now, Jesse, you told me earlier this happened at five or six. Is it five or six or seven or eight? And of mm -hmm. course, what does someone who has MR, what do they say? They say what their interrogator wants them to say. And he said seven or eight. So when you can hear the gasp in, in uh, Gitchell's voice, like, finally, okay. That, that, and, I, and I think he actually said on the transcript, well, that clears that up then. And then it's pretty much over. I think it was 12 minutes. And not, not that it, it excuses any of that poor police work, but do you think as somebody who's met these individuals, had conversations with these individuals, do you think that, that, any of their actions, were they done out of desperation or do you think they really thought deep down that they were doing the right thing? That is a very good question. And I did address that briefly, probably one or two sentences in the book. And I said, essentially, I can't quote exactly what I said, um, but I, I said, you know, the satanic panic was very real and palpable. And uh, I can give you a couple examples here in a moment, but in, in the in the book, I said, you know, once it became apparent and obvious and clear that these kids were innocent, they could have just said, "Hey, we screwed up. Uh, we're going to let you out of jail. Uh, we're going to have a new trial. We're going to do something to fix this." But what do they do? They dig in deeper, even if they were. Spellbound, that's a bad metaphor <laughs> for, mm. for a witch hunt. Right, right. But uh, it, it, even if they thought in their heart of hearts, as Fogelman once told me, we got. I think we got the right guys. And even if they believed that, once the wheels fell off the wagon, they didn't give up. They just kept digging in deeper because they didn't want egg on their face. 
And that's where it turns from, you know, uh, I'm sorry, I made a mistake to, damn, I got to make sure this doesn't come out. And that's why I wrote the book, because I was not going to let this this true story and let, let uh, the documentaries or Burnett's version or uh, Brent Davis's version be the final version, because, um, and I think I quote Churchill in the book, I Churchill said that history will be kind to him because he intends to write it. And so I kind of took that to heart. You know, somebody wants to write a book and claim I'm uh, mentally ill or whatever, that's their prerogative. I don't, but I had to tell the truth, and I had to do it in such a way that it didn't pose a risk uh, to my clients or the other two. Well, and you getting the phone call to represent Jesse Miss Kelly, one thing that people need to truly understand here is you didn't have to take that case you had and and not only did you not have to take that case you could have said no you had other irons in the fire at the time you were busy practicing law and getting your career going and and i mean you were busy with other things and i'm sure that yes you know the young man the fighter and you wanted to take the case but i'm going to ask you for a second you know we talked about the challenges the unique challenges of representing somebody like 17 year old Jesse Miss Kelly, what would be your perceived uh, from, from someone who's worked as a defense attorney for so many years, what would be your perceived challenges when it would come to representing somebody like Damian Eccles? Wow. Um, you know, of course, Damian did go through a metamorphosis of, uh, being someone who, naively believed that he couldn't be convicted because he was innocent and flipping off the TV cameras and the victim's parents and the news media, the local media, uh, would not show on television the parents calling Damien names and and spurring him on. Uh, and then he would just react by flipping the bird or uh, saying something stupid. That was news. That's how they created news. Um Damien had no idea, no concept that uh, that was going to affect his trial. And his lawyers probably had about the same success <laughs> keeping him under control as I did Jesse Miss Kelly Sr., who just continued to screw up our case. Um, and, uh, of course, this will blow your mind and probably everyone else who's listening. But at first, I thought he was guilty. It took me... 90 days into the case for me to realize, oh shit, uh, this, there's something wrong here, bad wrong. And and then we switched from, you know, how are we going to get this kid to testify against the other two to how are we going to defend an innocent client? And there's nothing worse for a defense lawyer than to have an innocent client. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that's the problem with being a criminal defense lawyer is you cannot control the narrative and in Eccles, it, it certainly to me, uh, and I've met personalities similar. I believe in my my life the, of the defiant till the end types. He, he certainly, like you said, and I, and this is one thing that I struggled with in this case was some of the his statements that he made was like, "My God, man, don't you realize you're on trial here, and and you're <laughs> saying you're saying that you're you you're fine with people when." West Memphis thinking you're the boogeyman and like you said, flipping the bird and, but, but it's, it, it's very much like another very famous trial where on the news, all we got to see was Michael Jackson standing on top of the car on top of the limousine and everybody (laughs) cheering him on. What we didn't hear or see was the persons in court, his accusers in saying what they're accusing him of. You know, you only got to see that those, those moments and in, in, in like the things that Eccles was saying and doing in the spotlight and in front of the cameras, they weren't showing what happened, what happened 10 seconds prior or what went down 10 seconds after you only got to see the bad guy. There's your bad guy. He's on camera. And this is a guy that we're going to convict. Now I, I would guess, and I think you'll agree with me that out of the three, Jason Baldwin would probably have been the easiest to represent as I think he would be more of the type of, you could tell him 
how to act and behave, and he would probably fall in line with that. Oh, he did exactly what his lawyers told him to do. And and it's really a shame that he, I always thought it was, was terrible that, that he had to sit through, because really it was the trial of Damian Eccles and the, but the two of them are sitting there together at the table and it's kind of like, well, if they convict Eccles, you're going to buddy. And this is, I guess another, this phrase is overused, uh, but it's oxymoronic for Jason's lawyers and their efforts to get a separate trial neutered themselves and wouldn't say the magic words. We have antagonistic defenses. And at one point during a pretrial hearing, I, this is not in the book, but I actually elbowed one of them in the ribs and said, for God's sake, say it. Mm-hmm. Why do you want to be tried with Eccles? And right. of course there was no response. And so then they had the audacity to argue in closing that Jason's only here because it's guilt by association. You wouldn't have that problem if you'd have had your own trial. Especially if you could have got your trial scheduled before Eccles. And then, as I understand it, they had just watched my trial three weeks earlier, and they couldn't have helped but notice that I put in lesser included offenses in the jury uh, instructions. And I wanted Judge Burnett to put it all, give me an instruction on manslaughter, which he wouldn't do, but I got him down to second degree murder. And the jury convicted him on two counts of second-degree murder. And they just watched me do that. And they, they went all or nothing and on capital murder. And, of course, for the jury to find Jason guilty, which they had to do because of satanic panic, he got life without parole. So they, they wouldn't give him a separate trial when all they had to do was say the magic words. Then they said he shouldn't be held guilty by association, but they put him in the same room with Damien. Uh, and his antics, um, which he's now very repentive of, uh, I just find it crazy that, that that's the way they did it. It is what it is. That's not the way I would have done it. And they just seen me do it with some success. I mean, I, he did not get convicted, my client, even though he was the one who confessed, if you want to call it a confession. Mm-hmm. But um, I call it nonsense. But uh, you want to believe that it's a confession. How come he didn't get convicted of capital murder? So if you give the jury options, then that gives you options, and it spared my client from the death penalty. West Memphis 3. West Memphis 3. Damien Eccles and Jason Baldwin. Jesse Miss Kelly. Who- West Memphis 3. Years old, Stephen Branch, Michael Moore, and Christopher Byers found murdered, hog tied, and naked in a drainage ditch in West Memphis. West Memphis 3. The state stands behind the conviction. Explore today's must-have trends and innovative styles at Mrs. B's Clearance and Outlet. Shop one-of-a-kind finds in today's must-have trends. Explore wall-to-wall deals, furniture, flooring, mattresses, home accents, seasonal favorites, and more. Discover unique new home decor, pillows, accessories, and more. There's something perfect for your style and budget. There's new inventory every day at up to 80% off suggested retail. Discover the style and savings of Mrs. B's Clearance and Outlet. 